Thank you for downloading this Council on Foreign Relations video. CFR is an independent national membership organization and nonpartisan research center. For more information, please visit us online at CFR.org. Welcome to uh, today's Council on Foreign Relations meeting. Um, I'm Joe Klein from uh, Time Magazine. And um, I want to say that participants around, uh, around the nation and the world are viewing this meeting via live webcast on the Council's website. Uh, they're sending <coughs> in emailed questions. Um, and uh, please remember to turn off all your cell phones and Blackberries and wireless devices. This, uh, this meeting is on the record. And it's going to be a, a lot of fun because I have to say, this is my ninth presidential campaign. Uh, there are no 12-step <laughs> programs for political junkies. And, um, and this is the most exciting and also the most consequential uh, that I've ever covered. Um, with us today are three people who know presidential politics as, as, uh, as well as anybody does. Um, and who also know international relations and, um, and, and, uh, and the rest of the world, who have done work in the rest of the world. Um, to my immediate left is Kellyanne Conway, the CEO and president of the polling com company. Uh, Jeff Guerin, the president of Peter D. Hart Research Associates. And Doug Schoen, chairman of Penn, Schoen, and Berlin Associates. Um, Emeritus. What? Emeritus. Emeritus. Actually, Doug and I are in a death race to see who can grab the title Flaming Moderate first yes. for our uh, memoirs. Yes. Um, so I know that this is a very high-minded crowd, and so I'm going to ask the question that all of you want to ask but are probably too decorous to actually ask yourselves. What do you guys think is happening? <laughs> I'll go... Um, speak about the party that you're associated with and the other party um, as well, please. What's happening this year? In the presidential race. In the presidential okay. race. A lot of excitement because on the Republican side there is no front runner. I don't know how other conservatives feel, but for my money I'm very happy about that because that's what competition and democracy are meant to be. For whatever you think of George W. Bush as a president, you should really reflect on how he became the nominee of the party. It really, it really was engendered by three magic words, he can win. That's eight letters, ladies and gentlemen, nine letters if you add an exclamation point. But if you go back to 1998, 1999, all across this country, people like me would ask folks very politely, say, who do you support for president? Oh, George W. Bush. And I'd say, great, why? He can win. It was always the answer I got. He can win. He's electable. And I'd say, well, why do you think he can win? Answer, he's high in the polls. And the professional pollster would ask innocently, I know, how did he get so high in the polls? Everybody thinks he can win. Plus, he raised a boatload of money. And I'd say, you know, he has raised money. That's very credible. How did he raise all that money? He's high in the polls. Everybody thinks he can win. They wrote him a check. We don't have that this time. The fiction of electability has been broken apart. And I think that's great because electability is a fiction. Uh, all you've really proven, if you say I'm the only one who's electable, or in the case of uh, Rudy Giuliani and Hillary Clinton, their campaigns were banking very much on electability or about a year ago, arguing that they were the only ones who can beat the other, which is completely unprovable, and which voters in the early contest anyway have, have said, gee, you know, we're going to have something to say about that. I think this election is, um, I've said for about six months, what I call a turn-the-page election, but people are starting to decide what it is they want to turn the page and see, or who it is. That was really in flux. It was easier to say what they didn't want in their next president than to really give a presidential job description, if you will. Um, I think that uh, I went back and looked at some research. In 1992, and again in 96, and really in 2000, Joe and I were talking earlier, the issues matrix were so, matrices were so different than they are in 2004 and even in 2008. In 1992, when Bill Clinton won the presidency for the first time, the top issues were the economy, deficit, and health care, according to the post-election polls, followed by family values, taxes, and abortion. We'll get into issues in, in the sure. next question. This is just horse race. And by the way, the last part of the, uh, the question is, assume a gun pointed at your head. 
Mm. Who are the nominees going to be? I would duck. And um, <laughs> I think professional pollsters should predict those things closer to the elections than so far apart, far, far away from the election. Um, I, I absolutely don't know with any degree of certainty who the Republican nominee will be, and that's not a punt. That is because um, the voters in three very different states with three very different demographic makeups already have chosen three different victors, and they may cho choose a fourth. Do you have a theory on the Democratic side? I think, um, that, uh, although I do think if you had to come down to two people on the Republican side, Mitt Romney's always one of the two people, no matter how you assess the calculation, whether it's based on money, organization, strength, appeal. Um, and on the Democratic side, I think Hillary eventually comes through as a nominee, but she's going to need to, wor to wear her war wounds a little bit better. She's, she needs to have more snap recovery and more resilience, I think, than she's had. Somehow they've let Barack Obama get under their skin, and he's a very serious contender to her this year. But they should probably let it show that. We're going to get into the issues later? Yes. The real stuff? Good. The real stuff comes next. Got it. Um, one thing I will say, though. I just is, wanted to get the quick and dirty stuff over. This is one thing I'll say, though. Um, why it's difficult to predict this race also is I think the polling this time, for all that's been talked about in terms of bad methodology or uh, race inflation, all this, look, as long as there are weathermen, pollsters will have a job. Um, but it, in addition to that, I think what's happening is we have some really serious issues around this globe. We have nations that are developing nuclear weapons. We have nations that already possess them. We have the sixth or seventh president in a row trying to broker Israeli and Palestinian peace somehow. And we have some polls asking, who would you rather have a beer with? Who would you rather go to the ball game with? Who would you rather ride cross country with? That just trivializes the importance. I know it's nice to have fun in politics, but that trivializes the importance and the consequence of this election. Why do you care who is more likable or who you'd rather spend time at the ballgame with? You're never going to spend time at a ballgame with them. You're not, you may have a drink with them. But it really doesn't matter. And I, I'm one of these pollsters who objects to that fluff and no stuff kind of polling because it goes back to the living room test of who do you want to live with for the next eight years as your president rather than who is most prepared or who would do the best job once elected. Jeff? I think the structure of the two races are entirely different. They're, they are... They are both close and exciting, but for um, a completely separate set of reasons. Uh, the, Republic, the, the Republican Party is a party that is divided onto itself at the moment. That is that there are, the, the outcomes are really the reflection of three Republican parties that are warring with, with one another. The, um, Mike Huckabee represents a very important part the um, uh, r religious wing of the Republican Party. Uh, Mitt Romney currently, I think, has you know, been able to represent the secular conservative uh, element economically uh, um, part. And, and John McCain uh, is an interesting mix of things, but he was successful in New Hampshire because there was an electorate there that was very conducive to somebody who um, appears more um, <laughs> moderate, but also <coughs> he speaks uh, to uh, a certain view in terms of, of um, uh, national security and, and the war. And so that, um, it, I think that's really the reason why it's hard to know how all of that will play out. But what, but what is knowable is that it will play out in a way that the, the end will still be a divided Republican Party. On the Democratic side, there, I think there, we have a really interesting race, but it's a, it's a coherent race in, in this sense, is that Democratic voters really are of one mind about um, uh, not just this election, but the state of the country. They, uh, that, um, they believe, we believe, that the country is in a, in a serious world of hurt and um, uh, delivered there in part by President Bush. But what this election is really about for Democrats is who has the leadership skills and, a, and the right set of abilities to get us out of the ditch and get the country working again. Um, and there's not, a, this, there's not a battle for the soul of the Democratic Party this year. That there is, you, if, if you watch the debate last night um, in Las Vegas, there's not a fundamental difference over issues or perspectives. There uh, consensus. What Senator Clinton and S Senator Obama are presenting are different 
um, different approaches to leadership. And part, part of the re and part of the reason that Senator Obama has been successful is he's been able to describe his qualities in leadership terms that is an, an ability to move, move the country forward. And so that what I think what Democrats are trying to figure out is what's the best model of leadership um, to deal with this. I don't think that in terms of what people are looking for, Democratic voters are looking for necessarily, is who's going to be the biggest Bush basher, even though Democrats almost to a person can't stand the guy. But um, uh, when we, at, when Mark Warner is a client of uh, mine, and when he was thinking about uh, this, we did some polling uh, among Democrats. And they are the, the very predictive of what's happening now. People said, look, I am not necessarily looking for the person who will who be, be the strongest in articulating Democratic positions or the strongest in, in, um, in stating his or her opposition to President Bush. I'm looking for somebody who will be able to bring us together and move us forward. Uh, when you asked about the qualities that people were looking for back then, they were looking for somebody who had a vision of how we fix what's wrong with America, uh, who had um, the ability to uh, bring people together. And for better or for worse, much further down that list was experience and electability. And so that um, in terms of kind of predicting how ours turns out, my honest answer is it depends. It dep <laughs> and, and it depends less on Senator Obama and more on Senator Clinton. She's, so? run, she's run two different campaigns. She's run a campaign in Iowa and for too many days from my, by my lights after, uh, after New Hampshire that had been about, um, about experience and about Senator Obama and not about her, what, what, what drives her to run for this job and what sets her apart in terms of what, how, how, how she can move America forward. So if she, if she had a, um, I think she, 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 she ran a really good campaign in the final few days in New Hampshire. I think that, that far beyond the, the, the moment of personal revelation, she ran a good campaign. She said the right things. If you look at, at her on the stage at her, her victory speech in New Hampshire and compare that to her concession speech in, in uh, Iowa, but the, just the stage management of the event, who was with her, who wasn't with her, who was behind her, who wasn't behind her, she, they figured out a lot. And so that, um, but, uh, you know, if she had found her voice in New Hampshire, she uh, got a sore throat on the way out. Uh, and um, so uh, to me, if, if she, the, 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 move, the movable piece here is the kind of campaign um, she ends up running and if as we move And if you had to make a gun to the head guess on the Republican side? Uh, if Kellyanne can't figure it out, I, 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 don't, I, I don't think it will be. Uh, she was hinting Romney. I don't, I, I don't think it will be. Um, I don't think it will be Huckabee. I'm, I'm, right. It'll be w one of those two. I'd rather, um, you know, we, we've had a lot of conversation on our side about electability. The truth is that um, general elections for president are never, har hardly ever easy. I guess there have been a few easy ones for the Republicans, not that many easy ones for us, and, or not since 1964. But um, the truth is, I think that um, that in this election, just in, in fundamental terms, Democrats are playing a much stronger hand for a whole variety of reasons, that the Republican candidates are flawed and very significant and substantial ways. And so while Democrats, you know, naturally fret and worry about the, the vulnerabilities of their candidates, um, I, 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 I do think that uh, e either one of these can go on and win against either one of of the other two. Doug, let me try to present uh, a third view, and Joe, I suspect you'll agree with part of what I'm going to say, and certainly not all. Uh, I, I would rather begin from the perspective of looking at the electorate rather than the Democratic primary, the Republican primary. I'll give you answers to your questions. But I think we're in a profoundly unsettled time. It isn't just Democrats who want to bring people together and stop the fighting. It isn't just Republicans. And it, it's everybody. And there are more independents than there are Democrats or Republicans. And people are angry for a variety of reasons. They're angry 
because of domestic problems that they see unresolved and a Congress that's ineffective. But they also getting close to where our program was uh, uh, supposed to start. They're profoundly unsettled about foreign policy. And they, they believe that there are real stakes to the decisions we make and particularly when you get past the audience of Democratic primary voters, there's a recognition that um, there are consequences to actions and that um, short-term electoral calculations are by no means the only issue that needs to be taken into account when we make policy. The reason I say that is on the international front, the absence of bipartisanship is seen as a great failing of the system. That's the next thing. No, I understand that. That, the reason I begin with that introduction is to suggest that while I think Jeff Guerin is absolutely right that the lay of the land favors the Democrat, whoever he or she may be, nonetheless there is this current uh, that runs through the electorate that, uh, sums, uh, that, that can be summed up by the um, uh, conclusion Jeff reached about the polling for Mark Warner that is, I think, a large current affecting the electorate. It's certainly something that has driven Obama. It's helped uh, John McCain with uh, independence come back. It's also helped Mike Huckabee in the sense that he's been a different kind of, um, of Republican. So I think we're in very much unsettled and uncertain times where, with what Joe suggests uh, is the case, real, real issues at stake. And I can tell you, when my partner Mark Penn and I worked for Bill Clinton, in the 96 election, which was a relatively easy election, Jeff, um, uh, that um, we had a sense, I think, particularly after 96, <laughs> that there were not real issues, at st uh, real central issues at stake. To be sure, there was uh, the bombing of Serbia, there was the uh, uh, attacks against the camps in Afghanistan, but you, you did not have a sense on a day-to-day -day basis that there were large issues uh, at stake in the way that we do now. That being said, Joe, to return to your question, my instinct is that Senator Clinton, by dint of who she is, how she's campaigned, the states that are in play, uh, her resources, political skills and the like, and her lead with superdelegates, is probably going to find a way to get the nomination, but I wouldn't be surprised if I'm wrong. But I, I bet on her. Um, and on the Republican side, um, I'd probably be a bit of a contrarian, especially after last night, and still say John McCain, because I think that there is a strong enough tide to um, redress some of the injustices of uh, 2000, and I think Romney is somewhat synthetic even to the Republican electorate, that I'm, I'm going to give John McCain the nod, but again, be even less certain about that than I would on the Democratic side. Now, let's go to, let's go to the, the, uh, the meat of the program here. Uh, speaking of McCain, as I've traveled around, I find that John McCain is the only candidate who spends an extensive amount of time talking about the war in Iraq. In fact, he's the only candidate who really spends a lot of time, who really focuses on foreign policy. So my question to you is twofold, threefold. Um, in your surveys, are you finding that foreign policy is drifting down uh, from, uh, you know, at first we thought this was going to be a foreign policy election. Now it seems it's going to be more of an election about the economy. Is that what you're finding? Um, number two, when people talk about foreign policy and when you ask them about it, what are they actually concerned about? And number three, uh, we're a room by definition of internationalists here. Are you catching any sense that the American public is turning isolationist and want, wants to make the world go away. Uh, and let me clarify, I think the race comes down to Romney and McCain for fundamentally different reasons, and that the next big thing you're going to see covered is character. That's different than what's been covered about leadership or likability um, and even experience. Character is slightly different because it's a hybrid of objective and subjective criteria for different voters, and I think there John McCain um, is unparalleled on either side of the aisle. The, the reason that John McCain talks about foreign policy, in my view, and the war in Iraq, specifically more than any other candidate, is because he knows more about it. And he's been a full-throated supporter of it, even when it has been incredibly pop, uh, unpopular 
among the public and, and certainly unpopular even within some of his, uh, among some of his Republican colleagues in the United States Senate. He was for the surge from the beginning. Some experts say now it's working. I think that that is um, a huge credit to him that he didn't sort of bolt. And, and to my complete dismay, I predicted a long time ago that Rudy would go 0 for 4 in the first four contests. He is the A-Rod of politics, got a great season it looks like, and then put you up at the plate when it really counts. And um, well, in this case, you don't even show up to the batter's box. You just go to a different state. But, um, but that, that aside, I am really perplexed how some very smart people who work for Rudy Giuliani never send him to Baghdad. You know, and then you contrast that to John McCain, who really goes into the belly of the beast and makes this a cornerstone of his campaign, even when other people say, let's stay away from that, and how are we going to handle, you know, they meet with their pollsters and their focus group gurus and their messengers. How do we handle George W. Bush's um, campaign in Iraq and Afghanistan in the next debate, and there's John McCain in, in Iraq. But going to, back to what you were saying before, 92, 96, 2000, practically no interest in not foreign there. policy. Conspicuous by its absence. Is yeah. it different this time? It's very different because abortion's not in the top six this time. And uh, that, you know, strikes people in Manhattan as that just can't be true, Kelly. And what poll is that? That is everybody's poll. Go take a look. And that was true of the exit polls in 2004 and 2006 as well. I think like 2004 and 2006, this continues to be a security election. But the security umbrella has been expanded beyond just Iraq, Afghanistan, and the war on terror and some other trouble spots around the globe. And it's been expanded to a domestic agenda that's about kitchen table economic security, health care security, small S, small S social security. You know, Joe, for the first time since 1996, we're seeing double digits in the suburbs among white women, suburban women who are concerned about crime. That had gone away for 10 or 12 years, and you're seeing an uptick in, in that again. So that's part of the security rubric. I think this, this election is about two big themes more than any number of issues. It's security and it's affordability. On the Republican side, national security and foreign policy is sometimes, sometimes is all wrapped up in the illegal immigration debate. That when you listen to people talk about security and immigration, they're talking about that in focus groups. They're talking about that in the open-ended questions. They're to, and the immigration issue is almost conspicuous by its absence on the Democratic side. The top five issues in South Carolina, the next primary for Republicans, are all separated by three points. N nothing cracks 20% right now, including the war in Iraq. That was so different from last night when 43% of pre-election voters said the economy was number one to them. It's 17% in South Carolina. It was 43% last night in Michigan. So it's fundamentally different. Um, and finally, when people talk about, you know, if you're in Michigan, you're talking about foreign policy, they're talking to you about trade and jobs, and to them, that's foreign policy. Um, I saw some polling, it's not ours, I think it was a Pew poll, a co combined 76% of Americans admit, and nobody likes to admit they don't know something, admit that they have little to no knowledge about the crisis in Darfur. And for people to admit that means that they're just only tangentially aware of it, perhaps. And yet, in the same poll, you have uh, a plurality of people approving of us sending troops there. I mean, think about that. They want troops pulled out of Iraq, and they approve, according to this Pew poll, of sending troops into Darfur as part of a mission there. Um, here it is. Do you think the United States has a responsibility to do something about the ethnic genocide in Darfur, or doesn't the United States have this responsibility? 49% of Americans surveyed by Pew said we have the responsibility. In a different question, 45% said they favor the use of U.S. troops in Darfur as part of a multinational force to help end the ethnic genocide there. So foreign policy means many things to different people, but nobody's talking about that. And um, I think unlike 92 and 96, what's remarkable to me on the Democratic side is I honestly literally don't remember the last time I heard Edwards, Obama, or Clinton talk about abortion, talk about stem cell research, talk about gay marriage. I, I don't remember the last time they talked about it at any of their rallies, in any of their debates. Gun control came up a little bit last night in Nevada. But outside of that, it's as if they've agreed not to just play nicey-nicey kumbaya on race, but they've agreed to not go near the bread and butter issues that used to propel the whole idea of having a progressive candidacy or the first woman president. Pr remarkable. Primary campaigns, I, I have a different <laughs> take on why it's not being discussed more now, and I think it will be discussed much more in the general election campaign. Prime, campaigns are about expressing your comparative advantages. 
Um, Hope is an advantage. And so that, uh, that for John McCain, it makes total sense for him to be talking about that in the context of the Republican nominating race. Hillary Clinton taught, tries to use experience as, you know, what in the, in the, what in the you know, imagine the worst. Um, but the fact is we're talking less about Iraq um, on the Democratic side, in part because um, there's not a huge debate among Democrats on, on this issue. So that the, 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 the conversations moved on to other things, sometimes I think irrelevant things, but candidates are looking for points of difference and distinction. Um, but that, I don't think that the fact that it is that you've got one candidate talking about it much more than the others is to say that it that it is unimportant politically in, in this election year and that it won't be important in the in the general but election. But in, in, in your surveys, you're finding what 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 Kellyanne just said that for uh, Democrats, foreign policy is trade, and and uh, and for Republicans, foreign policy is immigration. No, no, not really, not 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 not, a, uh, not, not at all. Um, look, this is all confounded by Iraq, um, and not just by people kind of litigating about what we ought to do in Iraq, that even though the, in, in, in this, we'll get to an answer to your question, the, even if you can, Americans say the surge has been successful, <coughs> um, and that uh, Iraq seems more stable, progress is being made, and yet, approval for President Bush's handling of Iraq has not improved an, uh, a point. Support for keeping our troops in Iraq has not increased a point. Uh, because that, um, for the public broadly, this is the, the, the metric on Iraq has changed from to when the hell are we going to bring our troops home? That, that, that people are, are aggravated with this because they think it's just gone on for too damn long. And at great cost to America, and this is this is really, I think, how the uh, in, in the, the foreign policy debate gets defined. It is not isolationism per se, but um, there is this very powerful sense that extends well into the Republican Party that we are spending so much there and ignoring so many of our needs um, here at home that we have to redress the balance. And uh, but that is not to say that people, people um, Americans believe that we um, can or should disengage from the world. People reject the language of ISIS. We, we did uh, work with um, Bill McIntyre for Public Opinion Strategies for the United Nations Foundation. People um, react, uh, reject both the language and the content of isolationism. But they, and, the re and we should talk more about this in a little bit, but the reason why I think that this will be a very important um, topic in the general election is that that the the 2004 election was really a post 9/11 debate about foreign policy. 2008 will be very different from that. It, this is a post Iraq debate. Not to say that people aren't still litigating Iraq, Iraq, yeah. but they've moved on to a new, different foreign policy agenda that is very different from the one on which they were acting in 2004. I have a somewhat uh, different perspective, I think, from Jeff and perhaps Kellyanne as well. But I guess I begin at Jeff's uh, last uh, last point. Um, when you start looking at the people that are going to decide the general election, I understand everybody here would like to know who's going to be the nominees, but there is going to be an election. We are going to elect the president. And you start thinking about the swing voters. And when you look at them, in, and you're a Democratic candidate, the thing that scares you the most is if you get trapped into an isolationist uh, set of positions in the primary. I'll get the troops out in six months. I'll get them out in four months. Uh, that is death in a general election because uh, some of the work I did this year with my former partner, Mark Penn, showed that once you get past the sentiments that Jeff initially described, there's a strong sense not only that we can't disengage, but that we have to be prepared to take action of the type that Kellyanne was describing, ideally multilaterally, but if necessary, unilaterally. And when we asked about the possibility of military incursions in Iran, North Korea, and the like, uh, there was a willingness to go it alone if absolutely necessary. 
And I'm not suggesting that there's this uh, current American foreign policy that is, uh, or American public, that wants adventurism. There isn't. And Jeff is certainly right. You ask people whether they prefer investment at home or more uh, international efforts, they're going to say invest at home. At the same time, they recognize that terror is a real problem and that we cannot walk away from it. So that if you say, as John Edwards did in one of the debates, terrorism, the war on terror is a bumper sticker, you'll get about 60% of the American people saying no and about 70% of the swing voters saying, you know, absolutely no. That, that, I think, is a profoundly important point to recognize and to understand uh, about where we are. So the Democrats, at their peril, will uh, avoid that. And the Republicans, I think, are looking for any opportunity they may get to make the case that not only are the Democrats big spenders, but they've walked away from very real and very serious international obligations. I, 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 I agree that, um, that this question of should we be prepared to act unilaterally is a very important, one of the two very important fault lines in the foreign policy debate, and that on that, uh, the swing voters may um, uh, lean more to the uh, Republican, or to the, to the side of caution. But that is not the same thing as saying we should be keeping our troops in Iraq. That is, that, that is the second fault line, and the swing voters on that say it's time to bring them home and so we can do other things that, uh, that those voters think are, have a more direct bearing on um, our and their security. But then why, Jeff, when there are actual resolutions, when there's actual legislation in the democratically controlled House and Senate to bring the troops home by a date certain that it fails? Well, you know the answer to that. It takes 60 votes. I don't know the answer. It takes, 60, I mean, it takes 60 votes to pass. Well, all the swing yeah. voters are so excited it takes about 60 it that aren't these guys worried about losing their seats? Well, I think a lot of, you know, the, the truth is I think a lot of Republicans will lose their seats. Kelly, are you saying that you, your data is different from his? No, not at all. I'm asking in practical terms. No, because I think bringing troops home is more of a bumper sticker than the war in Iraq, or terrorism is a bumper sticker. Bring the troops home sounds great. So does world peace and chocolate chip cookies and goodness and light and fill in the blank with feel-good phraseology and get 80% plus of the country to say that sounds great. But what, practically speaking, you've had legislation in the past year, a couple of times, putting that question directly to our federal legislators and... In a democratic controlled house, it, it, it's not even it. 60 votes. It's it's two thirds because you've got a president who who won't. Um, How many Democrats who, who in the Senate voted this? against that? Zero. Uh, one or two, no more. One, one or two. Well, I'm going to move this to questions in a second, but I just want to say that, uh, that I, I just actually literally wrote out the sentence that uh, given the fact of the economy beginning to slip. And given the fact that we're spending $8 billion a month in Iraq, uh, at least in John McCain's case, he's going to be very annoyed to find out that the war in Iraq is becoming an economic issue in this case. It is, yeah. And, uh, you know, you couldn't have said, I mean, that, that to have the um, Iraqi security minister talk about 2018 as the year when we can, we can leave, that's, that's not exactly what Americans want to hear. And when jo John McCain says, let's make it 100 years, right. that doesn't work too well either. Okay, there are, if I were John McCain, I've just come back from two days in Michigan with John McCain's home. He's very much in my mind. I would say to you that there are people who, have, uh, who are on work release who have microphones on either side, and uh, they'll be happy to take your questions. Um, when you do uh, grab a microphone, Say who you are, where you're from, and make it a question, please. I'll be brutal. Uh, why don't we start over there? Uh, Mel Heineman. I saw yesterday, if, a pr if accurately quoted, that President Clinton said that the Obama campaign was not about change, but it was about the feeling of change. Um, I wanted to ask you whether any of your polling or what's your impression, is he helping um, the senator's campaign, is he reinforcing it? Is he doing bad cop, good cop? Or what's the effect? You know, I, I, th I think the way I'd answer it is Hillary Clinton obviously became a front runner in large part 
because of the success of Bill Clinton's presidency. And I think every day he's out on the stump, that message is reinforced. I think that there is a double-edged sword that they are struggling to get the right balance with, which how much presence of Bill Clinton should there be versus Hillary Clinton, and on what subjects should he speak. I think that there have been some times that they have been more successful than others, but on balance, the statistic that I go back to is more or less likely to vote for um, uh, Clinton and Obama uh, based on endorsements. Bill Clinton was 44 percent more likely to vote for Hillary Clinton, and uh, Barack Obama, I think, got 1 percent based on uh, uh, Oprah's endorsement. So you can uh, obviously parse those numbers a different way, but I think on balance, um, Hillary has benefited greatly. I felt strongly that um, Al Gore should not have run away from the Clinton legacy in 2000, and I feel strongly that that Bill Clinton should recede into the background in Hillary Clinton's campaign in 2008. I, I, I agree with both of those. Um, for uh, for a variety of uh, reasons. For, first, she you know good cop bad cop. She ends up having to defend spend far too much time defending what he says uh, when he is provocative. Um, that uh, this is an election about the future. That as much as Democrats embrace the success of Bill Clinton's presidency, there are very few of them who believe we can go back to it. And that the challenge is facing the country now. And she has to be able to sort of do this on her own. And, um, and I think her task is really simple at a certain level. If she just needs to make people feel comfortable She's in this for the right reasons, that she really, that this is not about having the office, it's about changing and fixing America. And it's really, you know, they spend far too much time thinking about, you know, <laughs> is uh, Obama a fairy tale? Is it the reality of change or the, that um, if they get her part of this right, Obama's part of it counts a lot less. So. Could I just add, not that I would ever, ever want to speculate about what's going on in, inside of Bill Clinton's mind, um, <laughs> that there's a double-edged sword there as well. Consciously, I think that he sees her election as president as the final validation of, of his presidency. But there's this other side as well that is kind of subconscious, which is he's worrying maybe she's going to be a better president than I was. Um, I think that, and, and I think that there's an er element of sabotage, uh, unwitting sabotage that may be going on, which is all the more reason why Jeff is right. I believe, may I just, I want to weigh on this question very quickly. I believe in the unwitting sabotage part also because it's eight years of scrutiny of having to be back there, but not, but only in the shadow of the spotlight. And I, I think that's rough. Um, I've seen polling data, not my own, where he is a net negative when he says things like that. There was polling data in December when he first started, when he gave his wife the advice that I thought was very poor advice, was to become an agent of change that late in the game in Iowa, after she had spent eight or nine months showing, I'm the one who's got the experience, I've met with foreign leaders, I've been first lady, I don't think being first lady qualifies you to be president. Um, but it, it then I just thought it was reacting to Obama's message a little too much. But um, any of those people would love, any of those candidates would love to have either Bill Clinton or Oprah Winfrey's endorsement, any of them. Just ask John Edwards, who has neither of them. Uh, let's go over here. Father, you have a question? I do. Identify yourself. Stand and deliver. <laughs> Leo O'Donovan, Georgetown University. Uh, there's one name that nobody has mentioned, and I don't mean Pope Benedict. <laughs> uh, isn't there a mayor in New York that you'd like to say something about? I did. I think Doug might. Oh, this, oh, the I, I guess the um, point I was making implicitly that I'll make uh, explicitly now is that there is uh, enough restiveness in the American electorate that should someone like Mayor Bloomberg decide to get in the race, I think we'll see something that we saw in 1992 or uh, 1980. And that is Ross Perot. Uh, despite his flaws and faults and inadequacies, was the front runner for the three months he was in the race until he dropped out in July. And John Anderson, despite the fact that he was not particularly competitive in 1980, ran uh, in the mid-20s uh, 
1980. I think we're in a similar time with public opinion. Mayor Bloomberg obviously has a resume and has uh, considerably more sanity than Ross Perot po possessed, as well as a considerably bigger bank book. So I suspect if Mayor Bloomberg runs, many of the pundits now who are saying that he will not uh, be a credible, or no, I'm sorry, not credible, will not be a serious uh, contender would uh, find that uh, very quickly he would be competitive with the candidates of the two major parties. You had a question? Uh, my name is Juju Chang. I'm with ABC News. Um, Kellyanne disparaged the idea of elect, uh, likability, rather. No, in electability. Electability. But also like the drinking like the beer. The, the, but, but arguably the, the one, the of the, right, one of the biggest problems with Hillary Clinton's campaign, arguably, is the likability Oh, well, she's likable question. enough. <laughs> there are two. Right, exactly. Uh, so, so comment on that issue and, and how much of a hindrance it will be to her campaign. I think Hillary is too much Hillary and not enough Clinton. Um, she's the second most charming, accessible person in her own household. And um, in, in large degree, you know, in large degree, it's Bill Clinton who changed the job description of what you expect from a president because the rise of Bill Clinton and his um, successive presidencies, presidential elections, um, converged with an even larger multimedia platform, you know, with the uh, emergence of the internet and then the blogosphere and talk radio. And so this larger than life personality came at a time, even beyond Ronald Reagan, the so-called great communicator, came at a time when there was, e there was even more of an opportunity to cover him and profile him and get his message out. But he changed a job description. Um, I think it hurt Al Gore. I think it hurt John Kerry. It wasn't fatal to their campaigns, but Bill Clinton, has made us think that part of that job description is, I do want to lock arms with him. I do want him to be my kid's favorite, you know, adopted uncle. I do want to spend an afternoon with him, just shooting the breeze with a fishing pole in my hand. And I think that criteria like that were were more more benign in the early nine, early and mid nineties when he was running for president, and given the state of play now, her likability is a very serious problem for her in that she doesn't have anywhere to go. It's not like she has 64% name ID across the country. She has 110% name identification across the country. And I think her race is very difficult to survey, Juju, because women, um, women especially want to sound very progressive. They want to make history. They want to stand up for the sisterhood. They want to sound polite towards any former first lady, regardless of her political affiliation or who her husband is or was. And yet, at the same time, if you really get them talking, there's a little bit of a conflict there. Um, I can think of two big instances where women changed their opinion of her almost overnight when she became one of them, when her husband was, you know, discovered, revealed that her husband had, um, you know, had a very public affair um, and humiliated her. And people all of a sudden, you know, remember, it was Chelsea Clinton, not Hillary Clinton, who was on that campaign train with Bill Clinton in 96. Hillary wasn't there because a lot of... Americans, particularly women at the time, had a hard time with her as first lady. They almost overnight, then she was on the cover of Vogue, everybody felt sorry for her because she's one of me now. And then, of course, when she got a little teary, I don't say cry because you could produce more tears cutting an onion, but when she had her, I loved what you called it, Jeff, what was it, her moment of revelation? Um, that was great. Then, all of a sudden, the women flocked towards her because it was like, gee, I weep too. But um, that, that's, I think women in this country are stronger than to just say, I'm going to, in the name of sisterhood and likability, you know, vote for someone. But I do think it, it does great on people. Of, of all the things about, about having Hillary Clinton as the nominee, likability is that worries me not at all. I think her, her likability problem is a problem of reputation rather than personality. The more that people will see her. I mean, we, we, we've had this experiment in New York State. But only as long um, as she an eye, only as long as she does what you you said. Only right, right, right. As, no, this is only as this long is as she runs the way she did the last three days. Completely within her control and the last three days in New Hampshire. And she, uh, but uh, we know that uh, it is within her power to do it. I think I thought she was extremely appealing last night at the MSNBC debate. Dick. <clears throat> Dick Foster, Millbrook Management. Can a Mormon be elected in this country? A Mormon or a woman? Mormon. <laughs> a Mormon woman. Take one thing at a time. I'd answer your question, Dick, this way. I think if Mitt Romney is the nominee, given his history in the primaries 
and what political strategy would suggest, you will see him try to answer that question by making the election entirely about Hillary Clinton if she'd be the nominee. And I think that he will try to avoid answering that question because I think his last answer to it was only partially satisfactory. And I absolutely believe, and one of the reasons why I am deeply discouraged by the prospect of him running, uh, is that if there is a Clinton-Romney election, the way he will campaign will be sufficiently harsh and divisive that I think that the issues that we care about will probably go undiscussed and the political gamesmanship that the public decries will come to the fore. My partner well, Peter Hart studied this in for NBC Wall Street Journal and of, uh, of, the, of an African American <laughs> a woman and a Mormon, the Mormon has the steepest hill to climb Absolutely. by far. And that's because it's a Mormon. The question is no longer would you vote for a woman or would you vote for a black man is, would you vote for that woman? Would you vote for that African-American man? But the question still remains is, would you vote for a Mormon? Not really that Mormon, because only 1% of the country is Mormon or That's something very small. Um, I think yeah. he's a different kind. It really depends on how he defines himself. Back there. Uh, Stephen Black, North American Transportation Research Council. Just for a moment, back to foreign policy. Other than in Iraq, do we have much sense or any sense of what the leading candidates think are the key issues that will affect what they'd be interested in in the area of foreign policy if they were elected and who they might surround themselves with as key advisors? Well, on the Republican side, the candidates who talked most about foreign policy are Fred Thompson and, um, and John McCain. And, you know, Fred Thompson, who many people saw as the savior and was a front runner before he ran. Uh, if, if you just looked at what everybody's saying on paper, you'd say there's the guy who's talked most about Islamic fascism and most about terrorism and most about different hot spots all around the globe. Um, he's the one who wants to be the serious candidate who wants to make Americans, you know, eat their vegetables and take their medicine and, you know, frankly believes it seems that if you are looking at the presidential race to be entertained, then you ought to watch reality TV instead. If you're looking to find a new friend, you ought to get a dog. Um, that that's, this is not the this is not the right platform for that. This is the platform for talking about foreign policy. If you go back and you just pull what everybody is saying, he's the one talking most about it, at least on the Republican side, along with John McCain. Um, but I, I think that um, some of them haven't been forced enough to say it. And what is fascinating to me on the Republican side is you have this jumbling of five big issues that it forces all of them to be addressing health care, crime, Iraq, foreign policy, certainly immigration and certainly the economy and jobs all in one 30 minute 60 minute debate are all in one 30 second spot. Can I let me just let me just address that since I've been out there and I've been <laughs> watching these people very closely. There are a couple of really subtle bifurcations. Republicans will talk more about Iran as a problem. Democrats will talk more about Pakistan as a problem. Um, I think that obvious and then there's the obvious division which is the Democrats tend toward multilateralism. Um, and wanting to talk to Iran, Syria, et cetera. Um, and in terms of the foreign policy staffing, oh, the other really interesting thing is this, that the, on the Republican side, there is, aside from McCain, an absence of foreign policy and national security experience, unlike we've not seen in recent history on the Republican side. Um, and there is actually more concern and more... Um, more experience on the Democratic side in some ways. And uh, um, finally, on the Democratic side, in terms of staffs, there is uh, the bifurcation that those of us here at the Council on Foreign Relations are all too familiar with. Uh, Holbrook's on one side, Lake is on the other. Um, Joe, may I just add very yeah. quickly there? I think there are two, two quick things I'd, I'd put on the list. One is, as a point of departure, is the sense that America is less respected in the world. It's a, it's a profound feeling among the electorate, and it's also a point of departure for Democratic candidates, <laughs> and that part of our foreign policy mission is to, to repair um, America's reputation in the world. Um, the other thing that, that we find in the polling that we did for uh, the UN Foundation is the, um, the, the, the power of the intersection between foreign policy and, and energy policy particularly in terms of our dependence on foreign oil, that, that tends to be defining. And in the general election, even if it's not sort of the priority issue, that, um, that, that Americans um, 
accurately or inaccurately, I think generally accurately, have a sense of what it means to, to have the Bush foreign policy. And um, I think that that's going to be one of the questions for people. Are you, are, are you going to be just like him or different from him? I think people think of Bush as a foreign policy leader as um, being wrongheaded in a variety of ways, too, too reliant on unilateralism and a sort of a go-it-alone approach, um, too quick to use the military option, not the appropriate balance between military and diplomacy. And so that, 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 that I think the voters are going to try to want to place the candidates in terms of where they stand um, relative to where they think what, what they think Bush represents. When uh, Pete Peterson raises his, his index finger, I snap to attention. You seem to be sitting there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Pete. I, I don't know how many uh, voters there are like me, but I listened to all this discussion of uh, the future and change and the need for change and so forth. And I find myself wondering how much of that is real and how much of it is rhetorical, because in the field I know something about. There may be one or two. I have never seen a time when this country is facing this many long-term challenges that I call undeniable, unsustainable, and yet untouchable, I'm talking about the entitlement problem, which is clearly unsustainable. I'm talking about the uh, trade deficit and the current account deficit, where in 10 years we look like a third world country. I'm talking about the metastasis of health care costs, where we're spending more than twice the rest of the world. All we can talk about is expanding talking about our energy gluttony. Now, every solution implicit in change, it seems to me, involves some shared sacrifice. It involves giving up something in order to solve these problems. And yet I don't hear a word about what is meant by the substance of change, but an well, awful lot of rhetoric about how do, how, does, how do people feel in your surveys about the notion of sacrifice, which is usually, usually right, a euphemism for higher taxes or lower services? Yeah, Pete, I think the answer to your question is nobody other than Senator Obama, who has spoken at the most uh, lofty of levels about this, has been willing to take on those issues in a serious, fundamental, and bipartisan way. And what the electorate is saying from their own perspective, which is a obviously far less august view than anyone in this room, is would you just get on with it? We know there are these big problems. We don't deal with health care costs in terms of global uh, spending issues. We deal with what we can't face ourselves. We can't educate our kids. We're worried Social Security is going to be gone. What are you all doing? Would you please come together and do something about it? And the frustration I was trying to speak of was a broader sense in the electorate that what you call rhetorical um, uh, deference to change in the electorate, electorate's mind is empty because the level of dissatisfaction that the electorate has with politicians across the board is so palpably high. Yeah, but are they ready for... Yes, they're ready for it if both sides will do it and that there is some sort of bipartisan conciliation of the type that you've written about and that is so frequently absent. There is absolutely no evidence in the data that when people say, I like change, they, have, they make any kind of nexus between this love affair with a very popular word um, and changing our entitlement system. You know, it, it, in other words, moving the retirement age up or making it means test or anything. Um, if anything, people in this country love, have a love affair with a word like change and choice and options and revolution because they never really join revolutions, make changes, exercise options. <laughs> um, and so it's very easy to say externally, I'm for change, and they go to McDonald's every night in order number three. I, I do think this is part of, I think we're at a, at a special moment in America. And it is, um, I think Americans want, want to be asked. I don't think that, I, you, you used a phrase, not a word. You didn't say sacrifice, you talked about shared sacrifice. People don't think we've experienced that in America, that we've had a very unfair division of, of, of the sacrifices in the country. But I, I think people are, it, it is why the leadership qualities are so important at the moment, is that people, on our side, I think all over the country, people are scared about, are truly scared about the future. They are, they are desperately scared, if not for themselves, for their kids, and for what, what does this world look like for the next generation? 
And they will, um, I think what they are looking for, and it again, I think it's part of what the Obama, Senator Obama has figured out, is that somebody who will call them to be part of the solution. I mean, he's not laying out big plans, but this idea of somewhere along the way, people need to be called to be part of the solution. I think that that's a powerful thing to which candidates ought to be speaking. And that the, the one other thing about, that, about Americans is that, um, that I think they, that very often in these elections, they care less about the stands that the candidates take than the, especially right now, that, than that the candidates come to them honestly. And um, so I think it's a different kind of a moment than we've had in the past. We're, we're approaching the witching hour, so I'm going uh, to bend it just a little bit and take one question from that side and one question from that side. Ron? Uh, Ron Silver, Prima Paris Productions. I'm curious, uh, as the, the many responses to 9-11 over the last seven years, <coughs> uh, in some people's minds, perpetrated by this administration or put into uh, effect by this administration. I'm thinking about the reorganization of government departments, homeland security, etc. New legislation, legislation looking at reforming old le uh, legislation, FISA, whatever, NSA surveillance. What in the last seven years, regardless of which party wins the presidency, will be institutionalized that the next president will have to deal with what's been put in place over the last seven years? And that's a kind of objective institutionalization. Also, subjectively, what has been institutionalized, if I can cross the metaphors here, in people's minds about the nature of the threat? Is there uh, a recognition of a global ideological threat? Do many people in your surveys think about it as a bumper sticker? So the question is about institutionalization. The next president in terms of uh, government and legislation, and in people's minds, how do they actually see 9-11 in the last seven years? Mm -hmm. And to the extent that I understand it, the President's national security okay. strategy. Let, let me, oh, I'm sorry. With the interest of this. time, answer you with a bumper sticker, Ron, and say we are not going to elect a president, Democrat or Republican, who does not accept that there is an ongoing and enduring threat that is institutionalized in the minds of the American people, and no president is going to be elected who does not accept that and follow the logical implications of that in his government and uh, foreign policy. But we're not going to elect a president who has President Bush's exact solution to that either. Ed, I'm going just the farthest away. <laughs> Ed Cox, chairman of McCain's campaign here in New York State. Um, very current question. During last year, national security dominated on the Republican side. First Giuliani led the national polls, then McCain after New Hampshire. Given Michigan and the rotten headlines about the economy, is there going to be a change, a crystallized change, where your polls will start showing the economy and concerns about will dom that will dominate on the Republican side? And undoubtedly. I think the economy is the new front runner. It's the only clear front runner in the <laughs> Republican Party. Um, meaning on the issues matrix now. And it's not like nobody's been talking about that. They're not going to have to say, oh, gee, now I need an economic plan. Many of them have unveiled it. Uh, Mrs. Clinton was unveiling part of hers today at noon, as I understand, on one of the networks. And, um, but I think that Joe's point about what is the cost of the war and how does that play into the economy vis-a-vis -vis the American's mind if they say, gee, we're having a problem in this country economically because of the cost of the war, not because I live like a pig off my credit cards, which most people won't admit um, in this country, then, then I think it's a, it's a whole new problem for some of the candidates, particularly on the Republican side, to try to square what, by all accounts, is a slowing economy, a weakening economy, and the continued um, price tag of a war that's at least very unpopular at home. Either of you guys have final thoughts? You're, you're okay? Well, thank you all very much. Thank you for watching this Council on Foreign Relations video. For additional audio, video, and transcripts of CFR meetings, as well as expert analysis of international news, please visit us online at CFR.org.